I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I got to do is breathe underwater. Remember the undersea missile silos we were fiddling with a few episodes back? The Sea View seems to spend an awful lot of time checking up on them, which makes me wonder if they're really worth the hassle. But when the Pentagon says go check them, you go check them. We're over the silo, Admiral. Uh, Chip, lower the antenna. Prepare to take a reading. All right, sir. It's, uh, silo team. Uh, the serial number is 37620. Uh, use tape numbered 3008. Since security around that special machine they were using was such a fail, they quit trying to get fancy and just started doing it this way. The truth is, I don't know if these are supposed to be the same silos or not, but given the way Irwin liked to reuse ideas as well as props, it probably doesn't matter. It's all just a springboard for my dumb jokes anyway. There's nothing down there. The silo's empty. Sparks, give me the Secretary of Defense on the double. It's not the only empty one. There's no question, someone is stealing our missiles. While Mr. Morton continues checking silos with the sea view, Nelson and Crane will take the flying sub and look for any vessels in the area that shouldn't be there. The Navy is sending a nearby destroyer to help. I never thought about what a contradiction the phrase, a destroyer is here to help, is. Oh, it's a sub. There. See any national markings? Hmm? No, nothing. Right, let's circle back. Let's have another look. It's just the kind of vessel one might use to snatch a few nuclear missiles when nobody's looking. Also, I don't think it likes you very much. Nelson has Crane parachute out, but there's no time for him to do the same. All he can do is steer the flying sub so it hits the water at an angle that won't turn him to mush. Lee's not here. The destroyer picks him up. The captain starts a search pattern to look for Captain Crane, but Nelson overrules him. A conversation with Chip on the sea view confirmed that this sub has picked up at least three missiles. The need to recover them and stop this guy takes precedence, even though it means abandoning the search for his best friend. What about Lee? A rogue sub has found him. Take it back down. Level off at 150 feet. Yes, sir. Who are you? What ship is this? I am Captain Thomas Ruiz. Did you pick up another survivor? Only you. Your aircraft crashed and sank immediately. Now I have a question. Who are you? Lee Crane, Captain USRN Seaview. Well, the captain of the Seaview. The information you possess will be of great value to us when we return to my country. No doubt. We won't learn what country he means, and if he named it, it'd probably be a fake one anyway. That was how it was done in the 60s, because we didn't want to make anybody mad enough to start a nuclear war. Almost everybody was aligned with either the East or the West, and if you did something that angered Flirfitania over here, they might go crying to Big Brother Soviet Union, and away we go. The things we did to other countries, we had to do quietly and subtly, like we did in Vietnam. So you're the one that's been picking up our missiles. Why? You see, Captain, a very small country with a few nuclear missiles suddenly becomes a very large country. I have one more missile to pick up than we had for home. What does your suddenly very large country want that requires it to be a nuclear power? 
we won't learn that either. It's possible he doesn't know. He's just the guy tasked with getting them. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? <laughs> That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. While they're getting Crane some dry clothes, the destroyer is still looking for them. Bridge, sonar. Bridge, aye. Captain, I got something on the scope that sounds like a sub. Bearing 270 degrees. I'll be right there. Mr. Fraser, come to course 270 degrees. All ahead flanked. Prepare a depth charge pattern. Hi, Iser. Correction, the destroyer has found them. Admiral Nelson is also getting into dry clothes, but as quick as he's changed, he's right by the captain. Let's force this thing to the surface and get those missiles back, or else sink it and destroy the missiles. Captain, we're picking up propellers on the hydrophone. Do you have a bearing? Closing fast from the stern, sir. What's our depth? 150 feet. Go to periscope depth. 10 degrees on the plane, level at 60 feet. Our executive officer is James Frawley. No, he's not related to William Frawley, who played Fred Mertz on I Love Lucy. He started out in the early 60s as a character actor, but around 1967, he tried his hand at directing and fell in love with it. He did roughly three times as much directing as he did acting, and he made his immortality when he directed one of the most perfectly made and enduring films of all time, The Muppet Movie. He has my undying thanks for that. On all up. U.S. destroyed. Hard right rudder. Yes, sir. Hard right rudder. He's not running, he's lining up. Stand tubes ready. Ready, sir. Fire. Fire. I don't know what class of destroyer that is, but it looks to me like everybody was asleep. Sonar should have been bellowing about torpedoes in the water, and men on deck should have been firing countermeasures, not to mention firing the deck guns to blow the torpedoes up before they reached the ship. But it's hard to show things like that on a model that's probably about six to eight feet long. The captain and the XO are both dead. Ensign Fraser is now the ranking officer, not counting Admiral Nelson. They weren't doing this before the torpedoes were fired because... One of the torpedoes was a dud, but it's stuck in the hull and there's no telling if it might go off any time. Well, that's not good. That means Admiral Nelson will have to do it himself, but he might want to hurry. One hit, one miss. Finish her off. Take her up to periscope depth. Yes, sir. If you can get away now, give those men a chance. The wounded animal, Captain, is always the most dangerous. I'll please sit down. There will never be another Michael Ansara. I've talked about him many times and many places because he's been almost everywhere. He was the master of his craft and could terrify you just with a look, the way he did to Captain Crane there. Admiral Nelson must know that's Michael Ansara down there because he's not about to underestimate this guy. Stop engines, Mr. Fraser. It's alive. Stop engines. What about that sub out there? If the skipper's any good, he'll try to finish us off. It'll take about 90 seconds for him to come up to periscope depth and look us over. When he sees we're dead in the water, he'll need two minutes to reverse direction and bring the other tubes to bear. 15, 20 seconds of fire, and exactly four minutes, reverse your starboard engines and bring your port engines up to a head flank. Yes, sir. Incidentally, if Mr. Fraser looks familiar, it could be that you've seen him in one of his many movies, or it could be the family resemblance. His dad was a little-known actor named John Wayne. He appeared in a lot of movies with his dad, but managed to make a name for himself as well. He was offered the role of Superman that ultimately went to Christopher Reeve, but chose to stay by his dad's side and help him battle cancer. That alone makes me like him a lot. 
as Fraser, he's showing the perfect mix of I've got to do this and how the heck am I going to do this in his expressions. Nelson's prediction is accurate practically to the second. How's that for timing? Captain Ruiz can't believe it. Let's get out of here while we can. Steer 180 degrees. Yes, sir. Bridge, sonar. Bridge, I. I'm picking up those propellers again, bearing 070. Very well. Take 10 minutes to jettison the dead torpedo and make repairs. And we're going after that sub. Aye, aye, sir. Remember what Ruiz said about a wounded animal? He was right. I've only been in that situation once. I told the story here, so check it out once you finish this video. Right now, this wounded animal will start hunting as quickly as possible. It's obvious to the Admiral that these are the guys who stole the missiles, so they'll either surrender them or be destroyed with them. For most of us, that's a no-brainer. Captain Ruiz is a different matter. Captain. Destroyer moving up from astern. You might have known. This destroyer captain is no amateur. Oh, dude, you have no idea. He owes you for his flying sub, too. I'll need every bit of information I can get from your sonar if we're to elude him. Is that clear? Yes, Captain. What do you read now? Destroyer still moving in, Captain. Oops, you broke it. That leaves the hydrophones, which aren't a fraction as sophisticated as the sonar. He takes them down to 150 feet and calls for silent running. Range 300 yards, closing fast. Now it's our turn. Full pattern, fire. Full pattern, fire. Full pattern, fire. I've talked many times about the properties of water and why depth charges work so well. That's why they do that, and every one weakens the hull a little and makes it more difficult for them to stay at depth without risking implosion. They also work so well because you can grab stock footage and throw it in anywhere you want. I saw a lot of this footage in a video I watched on a documentary channel. But Irwin used it first, decades before they did, so haha ha for them. Manolo reports that the destroyer is right on top of them. They're trapped. Release Sonar Decoy. some sort of a decoy, sir. Okay, that didn't work. As a rule, tiny countries like Ansaritania got things like submarines from other countries that didn't want them anymore or didn't need them anymore or needed the money. They tended to be a couple of generations behind the current technology. That means the sonar on the ship is going to be way more advanced than Ruiz could imagine. He's changed course and dropped another hundred feet, but the destroyer is right on them. Up to 80 feet, reverse all engines. Up to 80 feet, all engines reverse. Something the sonar system has to compensate for is the ship's own noise as it moves through the water. Coming up shallow right under the destroyer like that puts them in the ship's noise envelope, so to speak, and the sonar man can't pick them out once they stop dead in the water and silence their engines.
That's a sound that'll haunt their nightmares, but staying silent is working. Destroyer beginning to make a spiral search, Captain. Good. The decoy worked. They've lost us on their sonar. Except if somebody does that. Let's do this, Admiral. Put it on the speaker. Get him out of here. Lock him up. I'd like to say it was enough, but it wasn't, so I won't. That decoy stuff they're exuding is good enough that the sonar man can't get a solid fix on them. Captain Crane is now in a storage room, handcuffed to a big valve handle. We assume that the sub was proceeding towards Silo 8 at her best speed. Now, give it the time of intercept and the course. Yes, sir. He says we should intercept them at such and such a point in about 46 minutes. Manolo, our course is 270. We should have the missile silo aboard and be on our way home in about three hours. If we don't run into that destroyer again. That's a bit more than 46 minutes. He just made a big mistake and it's not about the timing. He doesn't realize that the destroyer knows what his mission is and where he's headed next. His best bet would be to take what he has and skedaddle for home. It's pretty clear that the mission is blown. Even worse, Captain Crane has found some nice stiff wire within reach and he's picked the handcuffs. Watching him figure out how to use his foot to reach it and get it to his hand is worth watching the whole episode to see, but it's way too long to show here. Even though I've had a much easier time copyright-wise with Season 2 than I did with Season 1, that would get nailed for sure. Director Nasty comments to YouTube because I don't like it any more than you do. Those older submarines had round air vents, unlike the Sea View state of the art rectangular vents, which are much easier to crawl through. Captain, propellers bearing 270. Right on top of Sound General Alarm. <laughs> Now, when Captain Crane did that, you bashed him over the head. Make up your mind. The depth charge bombardment begins again. In the vent, Captain Crane is taking a beating. Especially his ears. The sound is going to be amplified in there and come at him from all directions. What's bottom depth? 700 feet, sir. Release sonar decoy and take it to the bottom. Captain, that's impossible. This is an old submarine. The pressure... I gave you an order. Yes, sir. The sub is rated for 400 feet. He's taking them 300 feet below the red line. Despite the hull creaking and groaning more than my joints, they settle on the bottom and go silent. Well, I've lost him again, sir. Nothing between us and the bottom. Keep your ears open. Let me know if you hear the slightest sound. Engine room, all stop. It makes sense to me that if he didn't hear them get away and there's nothing between them and the bottom, they must be on the bottom. But I was never in the Navy, so I don't know how they do it there. In any case, Ruiz's trick is working. Admiral, listen to this. 
my mistake was working. If I was Captain Crane, I'd start tapping out my name in Morse code so they know I'm down here. But I'm not Captain Crane. He is. Get in there and stop him. It's coming from the bottom, sir. Depth? 700 feet. Reset depth charges for 700 feet. Give them everything they've done. Pipes are spraying, sparks are flying, and in the vents, two guys are getting thrown around like they're in a clothes dryer. The captain says, get us out of here fast. But it may be too late. Oil slick, Admiral. Off the starboard quarter. During World War II, that was often enough to claim a kill, and the claim was often wrong. The most famous example I know of was U-869. After an encounter off Gibraltar, the first report said no damage was done. Then someone upgraded that to probably sunk. Then in 1997, it turned up not far off the coast of New Jersey. I've mentioned the book Shadow Divers before. It tells the story. The point is, Admiral Nelson is savvy enough not to take that as a kill. He wants to be sure. Leaking oil doesn't mean it's doomed. It looks like we got him, Admiral. Well, maybe that's, uh, that's what he wants us to think. If he's still alive, he'll wait until dark before he makes his move. That's why he's an admiral and you're an ensign, Ensign. Although your relative ages may also have something to do with it. In the vents, now that things are quieter, Captain Crane can hear that other guy looking for him. He needs to throw that guy out one of the vents with a note on his shirt that says, Now I have a pistol. Ho, ho, ho. Take it back down and hug the bottom. I can't stay down here much longer, Captain. We've lost most of our air supply. I'll wait till dark, and we'll give that destroyer a little surprise. Exactly what Admiral Nelson predicted, so he'll have everybody on the ship ready for them. Engine room, all ahead full. Torpedo room, stand by forward tubes. Prepare periscope decoy. Prepare periscope decoy. Aye, sir. The periscope decoy is just what it says, a torpedo with a fake periscope on it. It runs just under the surface, so it looks like a sub is cruising along at periscope depth. It's alive. Coming up, sir. Sound battle station. I can't imagine the kind of hearing you had to have to sort out those sounds. Sonar men were rare and appreciated, especially in the early days. A couple of decades after this, they'd have computers to help them identify various sounds and even ID specific submarines. Our man here most likely didn't have any of that. What he has are ears like Daredevil. They're ready for the sub and that decoy isn't likely to fool them. Decoy will reach the surface in 30 seconds. Give them another 20 seconds to spot it and turn. We'll fire forward torpedoes in exactly 50 seconds. That'll put the ship broadside to them, making it a perfect target. But Admiral Nelson is too smart to fall for that decoy. Periscope three points off starboard. <laughs> Mistake he's made. Come to course 035. Prepare to launch depth charges. I may have overestimated him. As quick as they're turned, Ruiz fires a full spread of torpedoes. Torpedoes coming in on starboard beam. Emergency! Back port engine, all ahead starboard.
nope, sorry, Admiral, he wasn't the one who made the mistake. The ship is doomed. But Ruiz doesn't want any survivors, so he surfaces to make sure he gets everybody. Now hear this. Everyone but bridge, engine room, sonar, and forward gun crew abandon ship. Abandon ship. Probably put another torpedo in us at any moment. So get as far away from the ship as possible. Ready your room. Send a distress signal and our position. Admiral Nelson knows that's what this guy is thinking. These two have a good chess game going here. Deadly, but good. They're pretty evenly matched. Engine room, give me all the power you've got. Then get off the ship. All right, sailors, abandon ship. Let's go move. Forward gun. She's coming up. As soon as she's broadside, open fire. I hope they're ready, because here it comes, looking like a duck in a shooting gallery. And why they didn't already shoot at the duck, I don't know. Now it's a contest of my guns bigger than yours with some side bets on who's going to sink first. Nelson has ordered everybody but himself off the ship. That would be why. It's way easier to evacuate one guy at the last second than it is to evacuate many guys. Put your guns down. He's ramming us. We must die. Try something like that and you won't care if they ram you. If either of them had the sense of a stale donut, they'd forget the gun and get out of there. This was a thing that a lot of ships did, especially during World War II. It usually did a lot of damage to the ship, but most often it did a lot more damage to the sub, and in several cases, sent it to the bottom. If a ship had had it anyway like this one has, it was a final weapon that the captain could use. It was a single-use weapon, but if you did it right, one use was all you needed. I don't like to say it, but it lapses into the usual cliche where they wrestle for a while, get belly to belly, the gun goes off, and the bad guy falls. I think our director had had a long day at that point and just threw it together. It's too bad because it's a trite ending to a good fight. With Ruiz dead and the sub as good as dead, Crane needs to scramble. Lee! Lee, it's Nelson! Admiral! I'll give you a line. You've got to get off that sub before it explodes. Getting you off there before it explodes seems like a good idea, too. Have him swim to one of the lifeboats. Instead, they secure the rope nice and tight, he climbs up it, and they get into a waiting lifeboat together. Again, it was right there next to the ship, an easy swim from where Crane was. But we've talked about it before, these two like to do things the complicated way. As soon as they're away, both vessels disappear in an eruption of Irwin Allen explosions. There it is, Lee. Small country that gave us some big trouble. The UN Security Council already has them on the cart, but then they have to pay reparations, of course. Mm. The UN didn't have the authority to enforce something like that. They could demand it, but the little country could say no, and there wasn't much the UN could do about it except sanctions. Korea and Vietnam taught them that invasion doesn't work. I could watch Michael Ansara in anything. He was in the original movie, and this was his second and final appearance in the series. I wish Irwin had used him more, but there it is. Besides, when your credits just for 1966 look like this and there's only one of you, well, 
all you can do is all you can do. The Navy was angry with Admiral Nelson for his maneuver. Not only did they lose a perfectly useful ship, it cost over $712,000 to recover the missiles from the sunken sub. He was informed that the cost of the recovery would be docked from his pay for the rest of his life, but upon appeal, his portion of responsibility was cut to half. They tried to stick Ensign Fraser for the rest, but he disappeared. There were occasional possible sightings of him, but most of them turned out to be Elvis. I'm breathing underwater, I'm weightless through space. I'm soaring like an eagle all over this place. Creatures most will never see are waiting there to look at me. And all I gotta do is breathe underwater. On the Pentagon, Pentagon? Water and an... I've talked about that ta 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 good grief. Admiral Nelson much n ta 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 The periscope deep co- <laughs>